We thank you, Lord God, for what you mean in our life. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you move in our life. Uh, because we've given you control, Lord God. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Lord God. Just as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord God. Uh, you know, nevertheless, let your will be done, Lord God, we pray. Not my will, but your will be done, Jesus. Right now, Father, we come to you. We come boldly before the throne of grace, uh, Lord God, to find... Uh, grace and, and mercy, Lord God, to help in the time of need right now, Lord God. I ask, Lord, that you would move out over these airwaves, Lord God. Touch and heal, God, everyone, Lord, that, that, that would be sick and afflicted, Lord God, with this flu. And, Lord God, I come against cancer in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Uh, we pray, God, that you would move upon every request that was given into you this day, Lord God. Lord, for you care for us, Lord. You love us, Lord God, so much. And, and we know, God, that by his stripes we were healed. That's past tense, Lord God. I know Isaiah said, by his stripes we are healed. And that was prophesied, amen, of Jesus taking the stripes upon his back, amen, for the diseases, amen, and the, and, and the different strains of, uh, of di those diseases. Lord God, and I pray that you would right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God, heal. Deliver in the name of Jesus, and we'll never fail to give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Praise God. All right, the true story of John Griffith. This is as told as uh, by uh, Dr. James Kennedy. Uh, the story begins when John Griffith uh, moves his family and their few meager belongings to Mississippi, where John finds a job operating one of those uh, huge railroad bridges that span the mighty Mississippi River. It was in uh, 1937 when this true story took place, when for the first time John brought his uh, then eight-year-old son to work with him to see what uh, Daddy did all day. And uh, the little boy was wide-eyed with excitement and clapped his hands with glee with the, when the huge bridge went up at the beckon call of his father. Amen. He watched with a wonderment uh, as the big boats came steaming down the Mississippi. Uh, Twelve o'clock came and there was no trains due for a while, so they went out uh, a couple hundred feet out on the cat catwalk to, um, to the observation deck where they sat down and opened their brown bag and began to eat their lunch. Uh, his father told him about some of the faraway places that these great ships uh, were going to visit, and the boy was entranced. Uh, the time whirled by when suddenly they uh, were drawn instantly back to reality by the shrieking of a distant train whistle. John Griffith quickly glanced at his watch and saw that it was time for the 107, the Memphis Express with its 400 passengers that would be rushing across the bridge at any moment. Uh, he knew he just had enough time, uh, so he, without panic and uh, with uh, electricity, he uh, told his son to stay where he was. He leaped to his feet and jumped to the catwalk, ran back to the uh, control room, went in and put his hand on the control lever that would lower the mighty bridge back into its place. Uh, he looked up and down the river to see if any boats were coming, as was his custom, and then uh, looked down to see if any were beneath the bridge. Suddenly he, he saw a sight that froze his blood. It caused his heart to leap into his throat. His boy had tried to follow him to the control room and had fallen into the giant gearbox that contained the monstrous gears that controlled the massive bridge. His left leg was caught between the two main gears and he knew that as sure as the sun comes up in the morning, if he pushed that lever, his son would be crushed by eight tons of winding and grinding steel. His eyes filled with tears of panic. His mind whirled. What could he do? He saw a rope there in the control, uh, control room. He could rush down the ladder that led to the control room out onto the catwalk, tie off the rope, lower himself down and rescue his son, climb back up the rope, run back to the control room and, and lower the bridge. He sooner, uh, no sooner as his mind had done that exercise, he knew there wasn't enough time. He'd never make it. And there were 400 people on that train. Mm. Suddenly heard the whistle again. This time, it was startlingly closer. Mm. Oh. He could hear the clicking of the locomotive wheels on the tracks. He could hear the rapid puffing of the train. What could he do? 400 people. But this was his son, mm -hmm. his only son. Mm -hmm. 
He was a father, yet he knew what he had to do. So he buried his face in his arm and pushed the lever forward. The great bridge slowly lowered into place, just as the express train roared across. Lifting, lifting his tear-smeared face and looked into the flashing windows of the train, he saw men reading their evening paper. A conductor in uniform looking at his vest pocket watch. Ladies sipping tea out of teacups and little children pushing long spoons into large plates of ice cream. Nobody looked into the control room. Nobody seen his tears. Nobody looked down at the gearbox that had taken his son's life. With heart-wrenching pain, he beat on the windows of the control room and cried out, What's wrong with you people? Don't you care? I sacrificed my son for you. Don't any of you care? But nobody looked. Nobody heard. Nobody heeded. And the train disappeared. Once again, it's time to say goodbye until next Sunday at this same time. Good Lord willing, you've been listening to the Singing Evangelistic Ministries program heard here on WTLO Somerset from 9 to 9.30. We have been your host, Evangelist Chuck. And we say God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you is our prayer. Bye now.